In 2016, after playing 21 seasons in St. Louis, Missouri, the NFL's Rams moved back to Los Angeles, California. The Rams have been located in Los Angeles from 1946 to 1994, but when discussions about moving to St. Louis in the first place got off the ground, many legal hurdles stood in the way. There are countless considerations and technicalities involved when a National Football League team decides to change cities, and thus by the very nature of dealings with large businesses and municipalities, contracts enter the picture. Contract law has been around for a long time. There is evidence that some ancient civilizations entered written agreements to negotiate terms, and contracts were prominent in Roman law, which is considered foundational to today's civil and common law structures. The Oxford English Dictionary defines a contract as a mutual agreement between two or more parties that something shall be done or forborne by one or both. And it goes on to add that the word is often used to define a business agreement for the supply of certain articles or the performance of specified work at a certain price, rate, or commission. I chose the Oxford definition here because it was under English law in the medieval era where many precedents of contract law were established. Some of the cases were mundane, like refusing to pay a negotiated price for crops, or taking money from someone for a piece of land and then giving the land to someone else. But others could be more interesting, like when a ferryman overloaded his boat and was forced to throw a horse overboard. Now despite these outcomes, most of us are familiar with contracts in a legal sense. They outline terms of an agreement and are often negotiated between two parties. And that's where the owners of the Rams found themselves in 1995, entering contracts and agreements with the city of St. Louis and fans who purchased personal seat licenses. 24 years later, many of those contracts and agreements have come back to haunt them, as many lawsuits were filed against the team following its 2016 move. Those fans who bought the personal seat licenses? Those seats were supposed to be for 30 years, so the license holders brought a lawsuit against the Rams for the remaining years they no longer could benefit from. And while that suit was settled for $24 million in January, other suits are still pending. According to the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, the most significant case alleges, quote, breach of contract, fraud, illegal enrichment, and interference in the business by the Rams and the NFL, causing significant public financial loss, end quote. The Rams and the NFL attempted to enter the suit into arbitration, which is a form of settlement outside the court of law. We'll talk about arbitration more later, but for now, just know that the Missouri Supreme Court ruled in September that the case must proceed to trial because the original terms of the contract in 1995 did not include the arbitration clause that the NFL added several years later. Consider now what terms and conditions agreements actually are, in a legal sense contracts between companies providing a service and people who use those services. In the case of the Rams, the team sat down with the city of St. Louis to agree on terms together for the team to relocate there in the mid-1990s. But you've probably noticed that when you are presented with a terms and conditions agreement before signing up for an online service, there's no option to negotiate the terms. It's take it or leave it. Oh, and if you do choose to take it, the company may change the terms at any point. So what would happen if you decided to take a large online company to court over misuse of your data? Do you have the right to have the case heard before a judge? Could you enter a class action lawsuit? As it turns out, most companies address these questions in their terms and conditions, which you've most likely already agreed to. And it's important to take a look at the legal implications of such agreements, because when disputes surrounding terms and conditions enter the court of law, the deck may already be stacked against you. Um, we do have a clause within our terms of service. I think average users read the terms of service and the updates that are very frequently sent to us. You know, we, we are in a societal debate, as we should be, uh, about information practices. We want people to be able to both review terms of service agreements and privacy policies, and we want them to discuss what they mean so it creates this type of feedback loop. When we talk about privacy, is it possible in the 21st century? You said you agreed when you signed up, so now what? I'm Ethan Smith, and as we'll find out, terms and conditions apply.
It stands to reason that a judge might consider an agreement between a city and a professional sports team to be different than a take-it-or-leave-it contract between an average user and a large online company. But are they significantly different in the eyes of the law? And if so, what implications does that have on our everyday use of technology? To get some answers, I sat down with these guys. I'm Chris Catropia. And I'm Jim Gibson. Chris and Jim are both professors at the University of Richmond School of Law, where they specialize in intellectual property law, copyright law, and computer law, among other things. And before we can dive into the legal implications of terms and conditions agreements, it's important to understand how we arrived at such ubiquitous and long terms in the first place. So the modern boilerplate that we know and love really originated in the early mid-1900s. The term boilerplate here is used to describe a take-it-or-leave-it contract that usually involves no negotiation between the parties. When we had a mass-market consumer economy really first start to spring up, people were purchasing things not just from their local shop, but from Sears and Roebuck across the country. And so there were a number of factors that made take-it-or-leave-it terms and conditions the way you had to do business. One was that you were doing business at a distance, so you couldn't actually bargain with the people uh, that you were buying from. Uh, The other is that just like the products on the marketplace were becoming standardized, it was just efficient for businesses to standardize their terms rather than make bespoke products or bespoke contracts. And finally, consumers were increasingly buying very expensive goods frequently in a way they hadn't before. Cars, sewing machines, those sorts of things, which basically meant installment contracts and extensions of credit, which are things that naturally have to be governed by long-term contracts rather rather than one-time over-the-counter deals. But in the early to mid-1990s, around the time the NFL's Rams were considering their move to St. Louis, things began to change in the world of terms of service. So kind of move along from the early 1900s to kind of more modern time. And we started having a push toward um, the sale of digital goods. And so uh, with digital goods, uh, while there might have been something physical like a CD at the beginning or a a box, in the end, the good you were getting was intangible. Um, And there were concerns from the person selling it to saying, well, I need to do something to prevent this individual from making copies and providing to others. And while there were things like copyright law, et cetera, um, contract law was a really nice way to now not sell the item to you, but simply license the item to you. And so then that's where you get the the terms and uh, kind of conditions that Jim was talking about get kind of blown up to be even bigger um, to prevent the ability for you to um, uh, provide a copy to your friend, right? Um, or in, I can even now distinguish the good to where um, I can only use it if I'm using it for non-commercial purposes versus commercial purposes. The rise of the internet also changed how terms could be communicated and agreed upon. And the rise of network technology also allowed terms and conditions to be much more easily imposed and disseminated. It's costless, essentially, to attach terms and conditions to almost any transaction, no matter how low value that transaction. And so it was sort of a a perfect storm. We had a mass market economy where you couldn't really uh, dicker over individual terms. Uh, We had an economy that was moving more towards software and services and the kinds of things, as Chris says, that you might want contracts to be used to sort of differentiate among your customer base. Um, And... It was really, really easy and cheap to do, which is why I think today we see contracts getting longer and longer and longer, because other than the one-time cost of drafting those terms, the actual dissemination and uh, gathering of assent from your customer base is actually uh, something that's essentially cost-free. I mean, it, not only is it cost-free, it's actually much easier now to, to define the exact second in which there was potentially an acceptance, right, particularly with click we call them click wrap con- contracts where you would actually have a screen come up to you and say, do you accept these terms? I can actually even find out, did you scroll all the way to the bottom? Did you read all of them? There are things that I can do now with regards to defining acceptance that the digital world kind of really allows you um, to do. This communication of terms has huge implications on how they are interpreted by courts of law if disputes arise. Recall that when the Missouri Supreme Court ruled that the case against the Rams could proceed to trial, it was because the updated arbitration clause from the NFL's new contract was determined not to apply to the original agreement signed by the owners of the Rams in 1995. 
A small change in the terms can have a huge impact on many people pending the outcome of the case. But let's dive into the delivery of digital software because understanding the origins of the agreement surrounding a non-physical good might help us grasp why we have such long and cumbersome terms and conditions across all major web platforms today. In the mid-1990s, software licensing terms were a big deal, especially once CD-ROM technology became widely adopted. Remember that until the CD-ROM, which holds 700 megabytes, file transfers between computers were limited to floppy disks, which held only 1.44 megabytes. An example of this was when a company called ProCD Incorporated decided to make use of the large storage available on a CD, and they orchestrated a simple but potentially profitable business idea. They compiled publicly available telephone directory information into a digital database and offered customers a copy of the database, which they could purchase on a CD. In 1996, a man named Matthew Zeidenberg purchased a copy of this telephone database and proceeded to resell all of the information from the CD at lower prices, cutting ProCD out of the equation. Once this was discovered, ProCD filed a lawsuit against Zeidenberg because, and this is important, the Telephone Directory Database CD also included a license agreement, which was available in text form on the CD, but also required users to review and agree to the terms before each use of the database. The Seventh Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals ruled in June 1996 that Zeidenberg was in violation of the license agreement because he had the opportunity to review the license despite not being able to access it until he had opened the disk and used the program. These types of licenses were common and are referred to as shrink wrap licenses, since most of them required you to remove the shrink wrap on a physical disc before you could read the agreement. This was an important decision in the court of law because it established the precedent that consumers could reject shrink wrap licenses by returning the product entirely, and that the opportunity to do so allowed companies to continue the practice of including license agreements that couldn't be reviewed until you installed the software. Jim Gibson is very familiar with these boilerplate or shrink wrap licenses. In 2013, he published an article in Richmond Law Magazine summarizing the findings of a study he performed. Well, so there were a lot of earlier studies of the size and content of terms and conditions, particularly in the world of software, which is where a lot of these controversies started. And they tended to look at sort of a stratum. They'd compare end user agreements for a particular kind of software across a bunch of different sellers. And I I thought those were very interesting, but what I hadn't seen anybody study is some sort of a, a kind of uh, consumer experience with contracts. So rather than looking across an industry at all the different firms and the kind of contracts that they propounded, I said, what if we just looked at a single transaction that a consumer would engage in? Because the consumer isn't going to buy each individual software package from everybody in the industry. They're going to pick one and buy it. And so what I did is I did a study of the, not really the content so much, but the sheer volume of contractual terms to which a consumer becomes obligated in a very, very typical basic purchase of a computer. And what I found, and I picked four different computers from the major vendors so I could kind of you know get an average, uh, I found that you don't add any bells and whistles, you don't buy the monitor, you don't buy the extended warranty, just the most basic thing you get would result in an average of agreeing to 25 different contracts over the course of that transaction. As I mentioned earlier, 90% of those terms wouldn't be presented to you in any form until the computer actually arrived at your house. Um, and that the sheer volume was somewhere north of 75,000 words, which if you read at a pretty good speed for reading legal text would take you over seven hours to read and which is about the length of the first Harry Potter book. And so, again, this is just one. Now, of course, a computer- And less entertaining. Yeah, yeah, not quite the page turner. So the, uh, and this is just one, right? If you're really shopping for computers in a way that would send a signal back to the marketplace, you'd have to do that multiple times and then choose the one you want. And so computers are expensive. I think the average price was 500 or $600 for, for what I paid. So maybe you should pay some attention, but I don't think anyone expects to spend seven plus hours shopping, so to speak, for each individual computer, just the terms, not the other features and the price and the other things that you would you would pay attention to. Um, and so that was, I thought, an interesting microcosm of, of this problem. Uh, you know, we spend 30 seconds on a website with terms and conditions at the bottom, and if it's five pages of terms and conditions, there's simply no way you're going to read them. The availability of terms doesn't always mean that users are going to take the time to read them. 
Additionally, as Jim and Chris pointed out, even though the terms from the study were the same length as Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, they would be much more difficult to read. Earlier this year, journalist Kevin Littman Navarro published an editorial in the New York Times in which his team read and quantified the readability of over 150 privacy policies across the web. It comes as no surprise that all 150 of the policies ranked higher in difficulty than the first Harry Potter novel, with most ranking more difficult than Charles Dickens' Great Expectations and Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time. I encourage you to follow the link in the show notes to view the editorial in its entirety, as it presents these data visually, including an example of how the readability of Google's privacy policy has changed over time, and how the majority of the policies their team read rank at a college reading level or higher. But this brings us to consider what is actually in these terms of service agreements. In the previous episode, we discussed how most agreements include descriptions of data collection practices and data use practices. However, if you've ever actually scrolled through one of these agreements, you'll notice many items. But I think it's important to walk through these sections so we can better understand the general types of information presented, as well as the legal implications of the document. As an example, I've chosen the Terms and Conditions Agreement for the website of The Washington Post, which incidentally is owned by the CEO of Amazon, Jeff Bezos. Based on the Terms and Conditions Agreements I've spent time reading, this one seems to be a good example of how most of these agreements generally read. So if you'd like to read along, this is available at the bottom of The Washington Post's website. You can look at their Terms and Conditions, and the link is available in the show notes. The first section header is General. This establishes that they may change the terms at any time and that by continuing to use the site, you agree to the changes. Following this, we have compliance with applicable laws, which includes an agreement that you will not use the services for any unlawful purposes. The third header is privacy. No surprise here, it simply provides a link to direct you to the separate privacy policy document. In that document, you would encounter language similar to the excerpts from BH Media's policy that I outlined in the previous episode. Section 4 lists guidelines for discussion and submissions. Here's where you give the website a quote, royalty-free, irrevocable, perpetual, worldwide, exclusive, and fully sub-licensable license to use, reproduce, modify, adapt, publish, translate, create derivative works from, and it goes on, but you get the idea. Anything you share on the website is licensed so that the company may use it for almost any purpose. Section 6 is Trade and Service Mark Rights, which is brief and says that the logos and slogans, etc., are trademarks of the Washington Post. Section 7 is a bit of a longer section titled Prohibited Conduct. It outlines how you as the user are not allowed to use the services to infringe upon others' rights, attempt to reverse engineer their software, violate their network security, and other things, but most interestingly, you can't, quote, engage in unauthorized scraping or spidering or harvesting of personal information, end quote. I suppose we'll leave that to the website itself. Sections 8 and 9 outline registration, security, and charges for services, all fairly self-explanatory, so nothing really that surprising here. Section 10 states that the post isn't responsible for the privacy practices of third-party websites which are linked on their website. We're getting close to the end here, so if you haven't dozed off or started using this section of the podcast as a sleep aid, hang in there. Sections 11 and 12 are everyone's favorite sections because they're the ones that appear in all capital letters. Suddenly it seems as if the document is yelling at you. These sections are the disclaimer of warranties and the limitation of liability. This is where the post offloads almost all responsibility for anything that could go wrong by your use of their services. This includes no liability for personal damages arising from your use, but also prohibits you from blaming them if your computer contracts a virus while on their website. These sections are very common across most terms and conditions agreements, but just going through and giving short summaries of each section becomes quite a slog. Oh, and we aren't even done. There are four more sections of the post terms. Indemnification, which prevents you from holding the post liable in the event you violate the terms and bring harm to yourself. Governing law, which states that the terms are subject to the laws of the United States. Termination, which gives them the right to terminate the agreement for any reason at any time. And finally, miscellaneous, which accounts for any additional terms that you might be subject to. So here's the question. How much of that actually matters to the individual user? Do you care about any of these clauses and their potential impact on your use of a news website? Probably not. 
I mean, one thing I think about with all this is that, you know, a lot of this, you know, so 90 percent of it, it, it really is kind of irrelevant. I mean, it's not irrelevant, maybe these little edge cases, but for most consumers, it's just irrelevant, right? The Adobe Acrobat readers terms are just not, I mean, I wonder like how many times we've, they've really had to worry about the enforcement of one side or the other or of that there. But the, it is in some ways the, I always, the costlessness of providing it, right? So I say, oh, some people think about contracts as just kind of risk allocators. And so the idea is the company say, well, I'm going to provide this Adobe Acrobat Reader to all these people. I don't even know who the heck they are. I need to allocate my risk. And so here walks an attorney and says, I'll tell you how you allocate your risk. Tell me everything you're worried about and we'll, we'll promise it away. Okay, right? And, and the consumer, I, so it's, it's, it's a real, it is a very weird situation. I, and I do wonder, I mean, if we couldn't do it, you know, maybe we wouldn't get the free Adobe Acrobat Reader. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you talk to people on the business side. They sometimes they're actually very critical of the terms and conditions as well. They they think it's it's you know it's it's surplusage. Like like Chris says, it, it often doesn't apply. But of course, as a consumer, you don't know that until you read it, right? So we can assume it's irrelevant. But then once in a while, yeah, something comes up and bites point. you yep. in the butt. And, that's right. And um, so you kind of still have to read it to be informed, but don't have the chance to do so. But I've talked to people on the business side who who not the lawyers, but the, the other folks in some of these firms, and they're like, I would be happy with a much 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 shorter set of terms. Um, but you know, legal advice tends to be very risk averse. And so because it is costless to add, essentially costless to add one more term to every transaction that your company will engage in with every single consumer uh, that it has, uh, people tend to default to that option. Again, that's Chris Katropi and Jim Gibson, and they're right. The reason most of us choose not to take the time to explore the terms and conditions is because the contents are completely irrelevant to our use. Think about navigating to the Washington Post's website to read a news story. You're focused on reading the breaking news, so you aren't concerned about what happens if your computer gets a virus from the site, or if the site's collecting your personal data. So what then happens if these issues do arise? What happens if they make it all the way to a court of law? In a moment, Chris and Jim discuss how these agreements are viewed in the eyes of the law, and we'll talk about why most disputes with large companies never make it to the courtroom in the first place. And also, we'll hear from someone about why businesses choose to include certain languages in the terms. Back right after this. Welcome back. So far in this series, we've mostly considered how terms and conditions agreements affect the users who agree to them. But what about the companies who are drafting them? What kinds of considerations need to be made, and do they differ based on the type of business? To help answer this question, I reached out to Austin Chandler, a recent law and MBA graduate from the University of Richmond. Austin had the opportunity to draft terms of service and a privacy policy for a company his mother started while he was in law school. Here's what he had to say about the most important pieces of drafting the privacy policy. Privacy policy in like layman's terms just breaks down into like, you know, what's going to happen, what we agree to provide to you, what you can do on our site or with our products, how much of that do you own, how much of that do we own, and then what happens if it all goes wrong? <laughs> so, so, so that's literally what, what it is. And, and, yeah. it's, and it's, it's an implied contract. It's, it's in, so in the privacy policy, first you need to say what is going to make it active. And what I mean by that is like, what makes it in force? And so that first thing is probably the most important thing is you need to say, by using this service, you agree. Mm-hmm. So it's really up to you how you define it, but um, I think that's when you need to look at your product or your service offering and understand kind of what you're going, you know, going through. But in general, you're going to need to understand how you're going to be using people's data and then how you're going to be storing it and what are, what are your policies around that. A lot of this could be very boilerplate language, but it's very important that it's there. We've talked about the implications of such clauses as they relate to large internet advertising, but privacy considerations are also important for small and medium-sized businesses. Any website which offers the ability to register for an account is collecting some personal data. Austin had to consider this for his mother's website since it sells products. Users would be entering personal information in order to purchase those products. The other main consideration has to do with something I mentioned briefly before the ad break, 
The next item that you're really going to be concerned about is what happens if someone misuses your service? So what if they start cyberbullying someone else? What if you find that someone is like a sexual predator on your website? Um, what do you do with their information then? Can you terminate their account? You know, do they own any of your intellectual property on your website? So you could see an example where you have a, um, let's say you have an e-commerce site and you have comments for blogs you know, on reviews. Who owns the comments to a blog? Right. Do you own it? Do they own it? And so those are some of the things you need to think about because if you're going to start you know, maybe using some of these comments and reviews as advertising material or any, in any sort of way, if you don't own that intellectual property, then legally you can't use it. Now, if I were talking to a small business, I would say, look, you might want to take the chance, mm -hmm. but you'd rather be protected in the terms and conditions and privacy policy ahead of time. You'll recall that in the Washington Post's terms, these issues were addressed directly. They retain a royalty-free, perpetual worldwide, and a whole lot of other adjectives worth of license to anything you share or submit to their site. There's a theme here I want you to notice. Since these agreements are written solely at the discretion of the companies offering the services, they can add anything they want to the terms. Recall that Section 2 of the Post's terms state that you will comply with all applicable laws when interfacing with their services. That brings us back to the legal definition of a contract. Generally, contracts are agreed upon in order to outline the terms of an arrangement in the case that something goes wrong. If something does happen and a court of law must get involved, the contract may serve as a record of how any disputes may be resolved. As we've seen in the digital age, things go wrong all the time. The Cambridge Analytica incident we discussed in the first episode of this show is just one example where millions of people were affected by a data breach. One of the other worst recent data breaches involved the credit bureau Equifax, which in 2017 reported that the personal information of over 146 million customers, including birth dates and social security numbers, was compromised. So how do courts view terms and conditions agreements whenever legal action is taken? This is an important topic to consider if a dispute were to arise between you and a company you've entered into an agreement with. Jim Gibson seems to think the law has some catching up to do. So although contracts have sort of grown up from their original sort of bespoke individually negotiated form, I don't think contract law has necessarily abandoned that model. And so the assumption by courts is that as long as you have this sort of theoretical opportunity to read the terms, then uh, whether you do or not is up to you. But the fact that you sort of you know click the I accept button or whatever the assent mechanism is, the contract will be enforceable against you. The problem with that approach is that because of the ubiquity of these contracts and our interaction with the digital world, you know, multiple times a day, it's actually really mentally impossible for consumers to pay enough attention to these terms for them to exert the kind of market pressure that contract law assumes they're doing. I mean, you know, Chris mentioned earlier that contracts are sort of becoming almost like features of a product. And normally, we think that the market regulates features of a product because consumers who don't like a particular feature won't buy that product. And that sends a message back to the manufacturer, and that manufacturer doesn't profit, and you know its competitors do. And this is the way that sort of the invisible hand of the marketplace determines what goods succeed. But if you're not actually paying attention to the features of the product, then those market signals aren't being sent, and the market actually doesn't properly regulate those quote unquote features. In this case, the market doesn't really regulate those contract terms. And that's just a function of the sheer volume of these terms that we have to deal with just to be regular old consumers in a digital world. And so courts, I don't think, have quite caught up with that reality. And so they continue to enforce them as if people have a real opportunity to evaluate them just like they would evaluate, you know, the the you know features of the car they're buying, right? Or, you know, the flavor of the soda they're buying and the things that are very salient to the consumer experience. Which means that these things bind us even though we don't really have an opportunity to truly accept them in the way that traditional contract law uh, would have required. Another potential area of impact is how established law affects the interpretation of private agreements, such as terms and condition agreements. Um, one of the other things that, that comes up with regards to contracts is we do have 
um, what's supposed to be this kind of interface with other types of law that if it turns out that a state or a, um, the federal government has gone into a space and decided to say, no, 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 this is the law of copyright or this is the law of trademark, um, uh, we're supposed to kind of have areas where that preempts this kind of private law or contract. Um, uh, but usually we don't allow this preemption to take place because we say, oh, no, it was actually a personal agreement. And what's different between the law and the contract is that we had this mutual assent. Well, if we turns out we actually have a contract that's a take it or leave it that everybody gets, it really actually kind of looks like statutory law. But the courts kind of operate under this fiction that, no, these were all these individually. So it becomes even difficult for um, there to be these kind of natural interfaces between these other bargained areas where society has bargained for you know, fair use and copyright law. But the contracts say you can't engage in fair use. Courts, you know, kind of cases, courts will say, well, no, this contract isn't preempted by federal statute because there was this mutual assent, this kind of bargain. It's like, no, not really. Like everyone who got the product agreed to the same terms. That sounds like moving to Virginia and saying the laws of Virginia govern you, right? There's not that much difference. So that's another thing that I think that kind of comes about here that kind of has an interplay um, to make it where courts don't get into modifying or changing these terms. That's Chris Katropia again, and the concept he just described is troubling. In theory, companies could include clauses in their terms which would prevent established laws from governing the outcomes of any lawsuits if cases made it to court. But that's a big if. There's another very common concept that is included in many service agreements, and not just for web-based companies. They're called forced or mandatory arbitration agreements, and they're present in everything from cell phone service agreements to car loans to bank account and credit card terms. And they're a large part of why cases in which companies violate their responsibilities to consumers often never make it to a courtroom. Arbitration describes a process where, outside of the normal legal system, two parties may reach a settlement around a certain dispute. The two parties would present their case to an impartial arbitrator, who would come to a decision and relay said decision. This decision may be binding, where the parties are then forced to abide by the decision, or non-binding, where one or both parties involved may still seek a resolution in court if desired. So a lot of uh, terms and conditions in the online and offline world, frankly, have uh, mandatory arbitration clauses. So if you have a dispute with the seller, you have to go to arbitration rather than go to court. That in and of itself I actually don't view as a huge problem as long as the arbitration forum that they select is one of the good ones. And there are a number of good ones in the country that actually have uh, procedures which mimic court procedures but are cheap and are fair to consumers. And some of them actually have uh, specific rules that apply to uh, disputes when one side is the consumer and the other side is a big, rich company and, and try to make that a more level playing field. But because of a really strange turn that Supreme Court jurisprudence has taken with regard to arbitration clauses, what those arbitration clauses also do, in effect, is close out any possibility that consumers can sue sellers in a class action. And that, I think, is a problem because class actions are really the only way for consumers to recover for small injuries that individually, of course, wouldn't justify a lawsuit, but in the aggregate are actually a huge injury to consumers as a whole. And so the fact that those have essentially become unavailable to anyone who has the foresight to throw an arbitration clause into their standard terms and conditions, I think, is a problem. If you think class actions aren't good, you know, I mean, and people sometimes think class actions are just sort of a tax on business that go into the pockets of plaintiff's attorneys, you know, that's fine too. But the way to solve that problem is not through arbitration clauses drafted by one side. The way to solve that problem is in the public forum that is our legislature, you know, and and decide we should get rid of class actions or regulate them somehow. I actually think these arbitration clauses have kept us from confronting that question directly because they've sort of sidelined those disputes into something which seems like it's about arbitration and in fact really isn't. In the United States, the rules for arbitration were first established in the Federal Arbitration Act of 1925. However, as Jim mentioned, companies are allowed to prohibit class action lawsuits as a result of AT&T Mobility LLC versus Conception, where in 2011, in a 5-4 decision, the Supreme Court ruled that the Arbitration Act of 1925 preempted other laws which guaranteed consumers the right to a class action lawsuit. If you're wondering why this is important, consider this example, and this is purely hypothetical. 
You accidentally overdraft your checking account and your bank charges you a hefty fee. You may recall that the fee was supposed to be maybe $10 lower than what it's showing on your statement, so you have reason to believe your bank increased the fee without notifying you. However, you have very little incentive to file a lawsuit against the bank for just $10. There are a lot of barriers here, like legal costs and time. But if the bank has been charging this same fee to many other customers, they've probably reaped a significant sum. This is a case where it would make more sense for consumers to enter a class action suit against the bank to stop the increased fee altogether. Everyone could potentially benefit by having lower fees, but a single consumer would not have to absorb the legal fees of the entire lawsuit. Class action lawsuits are often very lucrative for law firms, but ultimately net individuals very little. Take for example the lawsuit resulting from that Equifax data breach I mentioned earlier. Equifax was ordered by the Federal Trade Commission to pay $700 million to settle the breach lawsuit. But affected persons were offered free credit monitoring for four years or a cash payment of $125. As someone who was affected by the data breach, I'm still waiting on my $125. I'll be sure to let you know if it ever arrives. Small settlements like these are often used to argue for arbitration, as a 2015 Consumer Financial Protection Bureau report found that consumers were awarded an average of $5,389 after arbitration versus $32 for class action suits. However, as MarketWatch reported in 2017, these numbers can be misleading since arbitration settlements overwhelmingly favor large companies. Regardless, it seems that mandatory arbitration is here to stay for the time being, as last year the Supreme Court issued another ruling favoring arbitration clauses in Epic Systems Corp. v. Lewis. All of this goes to show that the legal implications of what's buried in the terms and conditions could have impacts on your life that most of us are oblivious to. To be fair, the likelihood is very small, but in cases where items of value such as your identity or money are involved, it's generally a good idea to at least be familiar with the terms you've agreed to. When it comes to the agreements we enter with digital companies, determining the value of the information you provide to a service might make you reconsider skipping over the terms and conditions. Earlier, Chris and Jim mentioned two ways that digital terms and conditions agreement benefit companies. I always say the costlessness of providing it, right? So I say, oh, some people think about contracts as just kind of risk allocators. And so the idea is the company say, well, I'm going to provide this Adobe Acrobat Reader to all these people. I don't even know who the heck they are. I need to allocate my risk. And so here walks an attorney and says, I'll tell you how you allocate your risk. Tell me everything you're worried about and we'll, we'll promise it away. And the rise of network technology also allowed terms and conditions to be much more easily imposed and disseminated. It's costless, essentially, to attach terms and conditions to almost any transaction, no matter how low value that transaction. Disseminating a product to thousands or potentially millions of users can be a giant liability. Companies use their agreements with consumers to remove many of these risks if misuse of the product occurs. Nowhere is this better illustrated than in the end-user license agreement for Apple's iTunes. In subsection G, the terms state, quote, you also agree that you will not use these products for any purposes prohibited by United States law, including, without limitation, the development, design, manufacture, or production of nuclear, missile, or chemical or biological weapons, end quote. Now, just the idea of using iTunes to develop weapons of mass destruction seems completely absurd, but clearly someone at Apple wanted to be sure that that liability was removed. It's more common that Apple's communication services may be misused in these ways. And it's this idea that led to the standoff between Apple and the FBI in 2016 following the terrorist attack at a San Bernardino, California health department facility. The FBI needed to obtain access to a locked iPhone they believed was associated with the attack. And upon Apple's refusal, issued an order under, and this isn't a joke, the All Writs Act of 1789 which was signed into law by George Washington. Anyhow, Apple CEO Tim Cook refused, and eventually the FBI was able to obtain the passcode another way. But privacy precedents aside, Apple's iPhones are so ubiquitous, it was only a matter of time before such a high-profile incident occurred. And it's likely Apple wouldn't have had much to worry about, given that all iPhone users accept liability for misuse of the product. Then there's the idea of terms being easily disseminated. Earlier, we observed that the agreement from the Washington Post stated in one of the very first sections that they reserve the right to change the terms at any time. This language is common across most agreements. Landscapes are constantly changing when it comes to how products and services are used. 
Chances are you've received an email or a letter in the mail notifying you of a major change to an agreement that you've already agreed to. Take note of these. Generally, if the company is taking the time and resources to notify you, it could mean something major is changing. Earlier this year, Chase credit card customers received a notice that Chase was implementing a forced arbitration agreement into its terms of use for many of its most popular cards. This notification came in the form of an email, and buried deep within the changes to the terms, there was a way to opt out of the agreement. All you had to do was physically mail a typed or written signed statement to a P.O. Box address that was listed. Needless to say, the number of customers who opted out was probably near zero. We're coming to the end of this episode, and like most terms and conditions agreements, we've covered many dense topics. And while we're nowhere close to the 8 hours and 18 minutes it would take you to listen to the first Harry Potter audiobook, I want to summarize and reflect for a moment. We've seen that terms and conditions agreements are legal documents, contracts between you and the company providing a service or product. Often these agreements are viewed by courts of law as preemptive to laws that would normally govern interactions between consumers and companies. This means that the agreements in the terms would apply before any other laws, even ones under which you might be protected. In some cases, this could be very beneficial to companies while diminishing the rights of consumers. However, it's also likely that if large companies didn't have these agreements to mitigate their risk of distributing their products to such a large user base, many modern products wouldn't exist at all. Needless to say, there are many things to consider when it comes to the state of terms and conditions in a digital age. And if you've paid attention to the news at all, you'll know that more and more people are starting to consider the costs associated with these agreements. If you recall from episode one, Congress held hearings following the Facebook Cambridge Analytica incident. And since then, the CEOs of Google and Twitter have also been in front of congressional committees. But what has this accomplished? And is government intervention really the best or only way to deal with the growing issues wrapped up in boilerplate terms and conditions agreements? That's next time on Terms and Conditions Apply. Terms and Conditions Apply is written and produced by Ethan D. Smith. Special thanks to my guests in this episode. First, to Austin Chandler for sharing his experiences drafting agreements for small companies. Austin had plenty more to say, but an audio recording error left a large majority of the interview unusable. However, I can't say enough about how much his ideas and thoughts contributed to the structure of this episode. Austin was also the one who introduced me to Chris Katropia and Jim Gibson, so I have him to thank for that as well. And speaking of them, if you'd like to learn more about Chris and Jim's work at the University of Richmond, you can find links to their faculty profiles and publications in the show notes. Finally, a special thanks to my friend Joseph Scoggins, who connected me with Austin Chandler in the first place. For references and further reading, be sure to check out the show notes or visit this episode's blog post on termsconditionsapply.com. The theme music for Terms and Conditions Apply is Let That Sink In, composed by Lee Rosevere and used under a Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 license. Other tracks you heard in this episode were composed by Kevin McLeod and used under the same license. Links to the licenses and more from these artists are available in the show notes. The music you hear now is Royale, performed by Josh Lippy and the Overtimers. For references and further reading, be sure to check out the show notes or visit this episode's blog post on termsconditionsapply.com. And of course, if you enjoy the show, I'd love to hear from you. Reach out on Twitter to the show at termscondpod. If you want to reach me personally, it's at Ethan D. Smith. And if you don't want to miss an episode, be sure to subscribe via your favorite listening app. Links and more at termsconditionsapply.com.